I'm Sherry Boschert at the annual meeting of the Pacific Dermatologic Association. Dr. Vera Price is an expert on hair thinning. In women, she thinks of it as three distinct stages that are age-related, but not necessarily androgen-related. Well, hair thinning occurs at three different stages. and We divide the stages based on the age of onset of the thinning. So typically, uh, if st thinning starts somewhere in the teens, 20s, 30s, up to the age of 40 approximately, we call it androgenetic alopecia. This is a typical male and female uh, pattern thinning that we're all familiar with. And if thinning starts in the late decades, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s, and older, uh, we're calling that senescent thinning or age-related thinning. And we now know that in women there's an in-between group where the thinning seems to start for the first time uh, somewhere between 45 and 55. And this is a less well-defined group, which is now being called female pattern hair loss, uh, where the role of androgens isn't as clear-cut as it is in the uh, early onset group. The, the tendency has been to think of thinning, if you know you have uh, androgenetic alopecia in your early years and you continue to thin in your late years, there's been the thinking that that's just a continuum, that it's part of the same process. And we now know that hormonally, uh, the enzymes responsible for androgenetic alopecia, namely 5-alpha reductase type 1 and type 2, their, their levels are way down in the later decades. And we also know that if we do um, gene array studies, they look entirely different if we take a group of men and look at these uh, patterns in the, the early onset group and the age-related late onset group. And we also know uh, what I like to use as my most compelling bit of evidence that it's not just a continuum uh, and, it's not, and it's not a dihydro testosterone mediated event as androgenetic alopecia is in both men and women. It, it's it, If we uh, look at the men who have been using five milligrams of finasteride, uh, which is known as Proscar, for their enlarged prostates, benign prostatic hypertrophy. If the age-related thinning was due to a DHT-mediated phenomenon, those men should be regrowing their hair, and they are not regrowing their hair. So I think that's a, a very compelling argument that senescent uh, thinning that occurs in our late decades, which I like to call age-related or wisdom-related thinning, that is not a dihydrotestosterone-mediated event. And in our later decades, uh, the finasteride will not be particularly effective in that later group. Some treatments work for all three stages and some don't. The, the nice thing is that minoxidil will work in all three groups. So if, if you use it properly, it should be effective in all the groups. And the thing about minoxidil is it works slowly and it takes time to see the effect. Uh, but if you have a follicle that's not fully expressing its full potential, uh, what we call a suboptimal follicle, uh, it will respond but you may have to wait six to 12 months to see that response. So minoxidil is the one option. Uh, the other option, which is a little, um, which requires a little more uh, thought, uh, we, because finasteride is basically uh, approved for use in men uh, who have androgenetic alopecia. Uh, if a woman cannot conceive, if she's had a hysterectomy, even if she's 25 or 30 years old, but she can no longer conceive, yes, finasteride it would, would be effective for her androgenetic alopecia as well. But as I say, you have to use that carefully because if a woman conceives while she's taking finasteride, and if she has a male fetus, the the male fetus uh, will have a genital defect. We now know that minoxidil comes as a solution uh, and it comes as a foam and uh, these are often associated with used only in men or used in women and so on. We know that uh, either concentration and either the solution or the uh, foam uh, version can be used in either men or women. The foam version of minoxidil at the moment uh, has been used and studied uh, officially only in men. So we don't have a study yet officially in women using the foam. But uh, there's no reason why you can't use the foam. That would be off-label. You have to take uh, all any concern about hair thinning very seriously. I think the first thing is, no matter what you think the diagnosis might be, I always check four lab tests in any person with hair loss, which would be a complete blood count, a thyroid-stimulating hormone, a ferritin, 
and a vitamin D 25 hydroxy. The latter two have to be normal for a normal hair cycle. So I always make sure that those four t tests, uh, those results, are, I like to have those when I see the patient. And then you simply have to take time to uh, do a, a thorough history. Taking a hist history on someone with hair loss or, or, or seeing a patient with hair loss is different than a lot of the other problems we see in dermatology because here we need to take the time to take a thorough history and that is time consuming which is why many of my colleagues don't like to see hair loss patients because they, they do take time. You check six things. You want them to have a period every month, a no history of infertility, uh, no, if, is there hirsutism, uh, do they have galactorrhea, uh, do they seem to be virilized uh, and do they have a severe cystic acne that isn't responding. All those six points would lead me to say uh, yes I think we should check your testosterone, your DHT, your prolactin. But if none of those six are present you don't have to do any hormonal tests. Just check those other four things that I said I check in everybody with hair loss. But no, then you wouldn't, if none of those six are present, you do not have to do hormonal tests, even if she has very extensive androgenetic alopecia.